So stand and we'll say the anniversary prayer as printed on your program. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks that you have consecrated for us a house of prayer as we celebrate with joy. 200 years of work and witness to the faith of Jesus Christ in and through the Cathedral Parish of St. George and St. Andrew, Kingstown. Remember the bishops, deans, and other clergy and lay persons who have served you. And we pray that all who seek you here may find you. Empower us as we seek to love, lead, learn, and serve like Christ drying on our rich heritage strengthen us in body mind and spirit that we may strive to forge new paths as a family committed to joyful service with faith and love as we a heritage through jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit now and forever amen please be seated It gives me great joy to welcome you all here this afternoon. Special welcome to Christina and Neil, who will be our presenters this afternoon. 
Without much further ado, I invite Unika to introduce the lecturers. Good afternoon, all. Our presenters this evening are lecturers and researchers at the University of Winchester, Hampshire, England. Dr. Christina Welch is a death studies scholar as well as a theologian who works in the Department of Theology, Religion, and Philosophy. Dr. Niall Finneran is an archaeologist from the Department of Archaeology, Anthropology, and Geography. They have visited the cathedrals on several occasions as part of their research which includes the recording of all the plaques. They are both here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines initially working with the Botanical Gardens Administrators and the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, but they have also agreed to share their knowledge of the memorials inside and outside of the cathedral and how they have been using them for research purposes. Hence, our reason for being here today. Help me welcome Drs. Welch and Finneran. Finneran, sorry. Thank you very much, Ms. Morgan, and thank you very much, the very Reverend O. Samuel Nichols, for facilitating this. Thank you to the congregation and, and listeners to, to come here and, and, and listen to some of the ideas we'd like to share with you. We're not really going to sort of go so much into the detail of the, the sort of major historical detail here. What we're trying to do is sort of show you how to look anew at these memorials that are around you, and they share them in common with many churches, not just here, but in the wider Caribbean. We've, we've done some studies of some church memorials in Barbados, for example, and we've looked at how they've changed over time and how they reflect different ways of thinking, different approaches to Christianity and different social and historical events. So very important like that. But also there's a bigger world out there too that we can think about how people commemorate lived lives through stone and through materials and through graves and so forth. And it's very, very important and it's a very neglected area of our studies. Christina, my colleague, has done a huge amount of work on death studies and looking at the way cross-culturally people commemorate people who've died and she has a huge mine of information across several different bodies of religious practice that she can draw upon and see patterns emerging and I think that's very very important that we see the bigger picture here. So this is what we're doing here really in the Caribbean. We've, we've undertaken some studies already in Barbados two years ago in March 2018 when we were over here for the Garifuna Heritage Foundation um, conference. We, we, we wandered into this church and we did exactly as we do when we wander into churches in Barbados. Tina gets her notebook out, I get a camera out, and we split up and we photograph the place and Tina's got her notebook and between us we're busy bees all around the place recording, taking photos, bouncing ideas off each other, <coughs> drawing conclusions as to what these memorials tell us and, and it, it's really interesting work. We, we love doing it and I hope that at the end of this talk you know, you, you'll look at differently at some of these memorials around you. Um, just to start off with the sort of basic contention here before I hand over to Christina, who will be talking you through a lot of the detail that she has found through her historical and genealogical research that, that puts a little bit of human uh, depth, if you like, to these memorials. Um, it's an aphorism by, by me, which I mean that it's a saying that we as archaeologists use, that the dead don't bury themselves. So frequently the, 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 the act of commemoration is a reflection of how other people viewed the deceased rather than how the deceased wished to be seen. And one of the things that you find within the wider British Atlantic world of which St Vincent was part from the 18th century is a change in memorialisation behaviour that reflects bigger things going on in society. And that's what we're trying to aim at looking for and understanding how these things around here reflect the bigger picture. And what you've got down here right in front of you is a memorial we've never seen before, actually. And it's really nice to, to see, and thank you for taking the, the carpet up to allow us to photograph these memorials. It's, it's completed our survey of everything going on here. 
There's a crucial thing going on with this memorial. It's, it, it's, it's, it's one of your earliest here, okay? And the language is very specific on this memorial, as are the motifs. We call them memento mori. When you walk past this memorial, the whole purpose of this memorial was to remind you that you don't have long in this world and you should behave and you should lead a good Christian life. So memento mori, uh, 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 something to help you think about death. And the language is interesting too because it says, here lieth, here lieth the body. Physically, it's the marker of a body. Now that reflects the sort of behaviour that one finds in 17th century contexts in New England, for example, and New England and the Caribbean very, very closely related, where you have, here lieth the body, the mortal remains. As you walk, par as you walk by, my mortal remains are underneath here. I was once like you, okay? But as that kind of puritanical kind of element slips out of historical thinking in the late 18th century and the 19th century, the language changes. And if you look around at the language around here, it moves away from here lieth, yeah, to something like in memory of, in loving memory of, in commemoration of. The focus is then on memorialization rather than physically marking where a dead person is within these memorials and here. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the people who these memorials commemorate may have died at sea, they might have died somewhere else, their body may have been interred somewhere else. So it's all of these things that one needs to think about and it's very, very important to give us a snapshot into the way of thinking about death in society across the ages. So I'm going to turn you over now to my colleague Christina who will talk you through some of the rich historical context of these memorials. Right, let's hope that I can actually get the PowerPoint to work. That's the main thing. Okay, so again, thank you very much. So this, the cathedral we're in dates back 200 years, but as a place of worship and a place of burial, it's been on a site for far longer. As such, it's important to remember that the memorials in the cathedral grounds only represent some of those who are interred within the boundaries of its walls. And indeed, as with the memorials inside the building itself, some only commemorate the life of an individual, not mark their final resting spot, as we see here and with the Leith Memorial. So why did we want to start our talk by talking about the dead? Well, as Niall said, the dead are part of a history of a place. And the past is often understood as another country, far removed from everyday life. And in this talk, we hope to, in some way, bring that past to life, make it relevant to the present, because whilst the history of this island isn't always an easy history, it's a past that has shaped the present, and learning about the past, about the people and how they chose to remember the dead, can help the present generation in developing skills that can help them into the future. We say this because the past is full of stories, and we live our lives through stories. Stories of everyday activities, of peoples and places, and stories of our ancestors. On the 14th, St Vincent commemorated National Heroes Day. It honoured the memory of Joseph Chatoyer and the Caribs who tried to free their land from British rule. Unsuccessful, most of the indigenous peoples were exiled to Honduras via Balasso. No one knows where Chatoyer is buried, but his legacy is strong. However, the man who allegedly killed him is largely forgotten. His burial place until recently was just underneath that chandelier. So stories are central to who we are, where we came from and where we're going to. Niall and I spend a lot of time in graveyards because we research death as a cultural phenomenon. Everybody dies, but the myths, the rituals and the memorials vary from culture to culture. And because social status and even gender can affect the material culture of the dead, memorials are inherently political. As Father Charles Card Reynolds noted in his talk here in November 2017, the plant memorials inside this cathedral speak to the need for an emerging community to demonstrate settledness. But in our talk, we go beyond this and beyond the symbolism of the rich historic marble documents to give an overview of the memorials and graves and show how spending time with them, looking closely into the styles of the memorials and the people commemorated, 
can help you understand the past and develop skills for the future. As you can see in this slide, graveyards aren't just for the dead, they're full of life. They're home to flora and fauna, and they provide us with an opportunity to engage with nature, and over time see how nature return, re, sorry, responds to changes in the climate. Graveyards are spaces where everybody can learn about biology, ecology, and of course history. Here we see a range of grave designs, but what strikes Niall and I is the metal railings that surround some plots. This isn't a current fashion, they tell us that the plots are not recent. This design ensured space was marked. The territory of the deceased was set out as a public statement, making sure that the living's descendants' social status was enhanced. The family could afford that space and could afford the decorative metal frame that delineated the plot. But this style of grave marker actually has a dark history that belies its later ornamental socio-political purpose. And this is the history of anatomy and the need for corpses on which medical students learnt their trade. The anatomical dissection of the human body has a long history, as does the practice of grave robbing. The first known cases of so-called body snatching date to 1319, when four medical students took a corpse from a graveyard to enable them to learn dissection skills. Prior to the study of human anatomy, animals were dissected, leading perhaps unsurprisingly to some interesting surprises for surgeons. In the 17th and 18th century, practices of grave robbing grew alongside an increase in anatomy courses. This was furthered by a decline in executions, which was a source of fresh cadavers for dissection, and the lack of any means of refrigeration to keep bodies usable for longer than three days. Now, grave robbing was a crime, but one condoned by many medical practitioners, given the wider public good of the benefits knowing about the human body would bring. Autopsies could, for instance, demonstrate deliberate poisoning over a natural death. And because of the knowledge that the dissection of the human cadaver has brought, today organs can be repaired or transplanted. So the history of anatomy is an uncomfortable one. And of course, while few people were overly concerned about the post-mortem fate of an executed criminal, most people were concerned about the violation of a body buried in consecrated ground because it may mean that that person missed out on their proper afterlife. And in fact, it's only in some religious traditions, and even then only recently, that resurrection has not required an intact body. So to stop the so-called resurrectionists from taking the corpse of your loved one, there are a number of measures that could be taken. If you were poor, then your grave would just be a hole in the ground and an easy target. So you hoped that the local cemetery dog would be a deterrent, or you had someone sit on your grave for three days and three nights. If you have money, though, you had a slab that would need to be removed before the corpse could be taken. But harder still was to have a form of railings that meant the body didn't just have to be lifted from the ground, it had to be lifted over a fence. A fence such as those shown here would make body snatching very hard. Over time, though, these railings lost their practical purpose but they remained as a decorative feature and a territorial marker. With no anatomy school on St Vincent, body snatching would not have been an issue. But what you see here is a status symbol, a sign that the family were wealthy, that they were able to mark their plot and they had an understanding of grave memorials. This slide shows some different examples with different designs. The one in the foreground marks a single grave spot. The railings are elaborate and as such costly. So this grave shows that someone with wealth was buried here. It's also close to the church and thus in the most prestigious location, about far more prestigious than graves out towards the cemetery wall. Sadly though, without the burial records, it's impossible to know who this individual was. But the finials themselves show a high level of craftsmanship that went into this memorial. Whoever commissioned this memorial wanted to ensure that the social status of the deceased individual and of themselves was noted. Just check this is on the right one. Yeah. Okay, so this grave echoes metal railings design, but it's more recent and cast in concrete. This is to Moses II Hasu, died in 1911, and the wording is rather lovely. It says he departed this life, age 62, and is asleep in Jesus. 
clearly an elaborate and expensive memorial, it's unclear whether it was erected shortly after his death or in 1492, which is the date that appears at the bottom of the upright stones. We suggest the latter. This is a slab memorial, and in this case marks the grave of Mary Ann Taylor and her only infant Gertrude. The memorial does not state how they died, but the wording includes Edward Taylor, noting he mourned his loss as a husband and father. Given Gertrude died before Mary, we can only imagine her grief. But what's interesting here is that Edward's name is prominent. The memorial may be to his wife and child, but his name and social status are clearly marked out for all to see. Given each letter incised into the slab would cost, this grave marker was not only a public display of grief, but also of his wealth and social status within the community. The Taylor Memorial... Am I? Okay, is that on? Oh, is that Gertrude? That's Gertrude. Yeah, okay, sorry, that's the Gertrude Memorial. Next one. No, that's. Oh, I'm going back. I'm going back. There we are. So, next one. Brilliant, thank you. I'll do it. Sorry, folks. So, the Taylor Memorial dates to 1810, um, and this one is slightly later. Once more, the father's name is prominent, and this is typical of memorials. As well as memorials largely speaking of social status, they also give us an insight into gender issues of the time. As was normal during this period of history, in European society, children were the property of their fathers. But from the wording, we can tell more about the island community of this period, as Richard Arundel was a medical doctor. And as we shall see shortly, a number of other memorials give us information about the professions of people living and working here. But before moving on to talking about jobs, we wish to remain with the death of the young. Here we see two grave markers for children. They're too badly worn to locate the names of the deceased, but their small size shows they were infants. Now, there would be numerous unmarked graves on the site, largely outside. So it's likely that these were two of many young children who lived out their very short life on this island, of whom we know nothing and probably never will. So graveyards are important sites of historical knowledge. They reek of meaning. As noted, there will be many unmarked graves, people too poor to be able to memorialise their loss publicly. And sadly, also those without sa social status, such as the enslaved, who may never have even been given a final resting space in consecrated ground. But for those who could afford it, the death of a loved one enabled the family to publicly mark their status in society. And for us today, learn a little more about the past than history books might tell. So these memorials are a case in point. They are to men with the surname Learmond, with their Scottish ancestry in Jedburgh, clear from the headstones. George was, as we can see from the transcription on the memorial, a blacksmith. And it seems he'd been a long one on this island when he died in 1810, aged 50 years. And one wonders if he made some of the metal railings that we showed earlier. These headstones are traditionally British in design, and Niall and I have yet to establish whether these colonial era memorials would have been incised locally, on imported stone, or imported as you see them now. Robert's memorial, which dates to 1850, is a different design to George's, which suggests a change in mortuary fashion consistent with mainland Britain. But we need to do more research to fully understand this. Here we see a definitely imported memorial and another of the imported designs, a broken column. This is one of many traditional forms of memorial where understanding visual language is important. A good deal of the symbols on the memorials can be, as Father Charles explained in his talk, quite opaque in meaning, but here it's clear, a life cut short signified by a broken column. The column relates to the fashion for classicism which started in the 16th century but found its heyday in the 18th and early 19th century when Greek and Roman revivalism really began to phase out the love of Baroque cherubs and garlands of fruit and flowers on the memorials of the social elite. The symbolism of memorials features strongly in the ones inside the cathedral because of course in here they've remained unweathered. And also, being of marble, they were literally designed with their visual language to the floor. So, in a, in a short while, we'll explore a few more of them and what they mean. But before heading inside, 
and looking at some of the expensive and lavish memorials to the departed, we'd like to talk a little more about some of the more recent grave designs and what they mean in the context of a developing Vincentian mortuary tradition. Here we see two examples of an almost shield-style memorial. They have clear Christian symbolism. Baptiste and Smith have a cross and Stokes a Bible and an angel. But what is really noticeable here is the sunset, sunrise dating. And even though both have this, the memorials were clearly written by different people. And you can, reverse, you can note the reversing of the letter N on Stokes. Next slide. Here we see the same sort of memorial style, white painted grave markers, although the dating is more traditional. This style seems to date from the 1970s and stands in marked contrast to the imported earlier English memorials, the British memorials, or even the more recent American style designs of which this one is typical. Now we make no judgments here, but as scholars looking at death in a variety of ways, the simple white markers stand out to us as a style unique to a Caribbean that does things its own way. The incised granite memorials are almost ubiquitous in Barbados, but seem to be less so here. That they exist, though, is a telltale sign of the increasing influence of American culture on this island. Given that for us, wandering around graveyards is an almost daily activity, and that we know in the Caribbean this is probably seen as slightly unusual activity, the next few slides show just how informative a stroll through a cemetery can be. Here in this shot, we see a number of grave markers, different in shape and size as well as material. Two individual brick graves are evidence here, as well as larger, possibly family tomb. Here you see table tombs, raised memorials that rarely contained a body when they were located outside. The body would be in the earth. But the memorial itself is elevated and as such really visible. Of course, they cost more than a slab that lies flat on the earth and often had many words, or in the case of this one, displayed a family crest. Here we see a mix of old and new, a family burial area enclosed with metal railings and a more recent double grave decorated with tiles. And here, just how much a graveyard can tell us about time. We have a traditional colonial era memorials, the Vincentian tiled graves and a recent American design. Like all things, graveyards reflect a community, the tastes of time and the social status and gender issues that go with it. Now this memorial is typical of a wealthy, high status individual. It's large, but atypical in design and very costly. It's clearly imported and displays the Grecian style of memorial typical of the late 18th century. What is perhaps unusual about this is that it is a memorial only. There is no body here. Leybourne died in Grenada, and this memorial commemorates his social role and his governorship on this and other islands. The inclusion of His Majesties in the script emphasises the ceding of the Southern Caribbean Islands to the British, and note that St Vincent is called St Vincent's. It, so the, the actual title of St Vincent as a country has changed, and this shows how. Next slide. As noted on the memorial urn, William Laybourne Laybourne died young, at just 36 years of age. Despite being painted by one of England's most celebrated portrait painters, Thomas Gainsborough, little is known about his life. He, like Governor Valentine Morris, who succeeded him though, refused to fund the botanical gardens. Now given that one of the main remits of the botanical gardens was to grow medicinal plants to improve the overall life of the colony, this lack of funding seems somewhat against the principles of humanity that the British authorities were tasked with the colony at the time. And it's also somewhat ironic that Leyburn died of a fever. Note here that his name is spelt with a U, whereas on the urn, the graveyard is spelt without a U. Now, we're not sure why there was a discrepancy, but at the time, English words like labour and colour were often spelt on memorials in a way that we'd now understand as an American form. Adding a U to certain words was considered a little bit common by the upper classes and particularly the more elite memorial masons. So it could explain the spelling discrepancy. And we can show you some evidence of this spelling discrepancy on memorials around the cathedral. The last of the memorials in the graveyard that we're covering is to Brisbane. 
He's buried outside in the graveyard beneath a table tomb with a fully inscribed memorial slab. Now, interestingly, the words incised on the outside memorial are identical to the ones scribed on the inside one. Now, the inside memorial is very grand and includes his medal as well as multiple representations that visually depict his military career. Next slide. The memorial erected by his children in England echoes his military achievements, but also speaks to the character of him as a man and includes a memorial to his wife. Next slide. That Brisbane was a significant figure in British history is evident from the painting showing him conquering Curaçao and the set of stamps issued in 1969 that commemorate the bicentenary of his birth. These were issued a decade before St Vincent became independent and as such his status here today may be less celebrated than it was in bygone years. Next one. And here's where we wish to really emphasise the importance of memorial in terms not just physical history of a place but in terms of what they can provide people today in regard to the development of skills. As shown, by exploring the graveyard, a visual inspection of the site can develop not only visual literacy and an archaeological approach to the past, but by messing around with photographs of memorials, digital skills can be enhanced, allowing inscriptions to be revealed. These inscriptions, along with those on the memorials inside the cathedral, can be used as the basis for developing historical research skills. So what follows now is a brief set of biographies about some of the people commemorated inside the cathedral, along with information about relevant acquaintances. Virtually all of the information has been taken from freely available websites, and we hope this talk not just informs you all, but inspires you to consider researching as a way of learning more about the history of your island. John Dalziel's memorial tell us, tells us he died in 1829, aged 47 was Speaker of the House of Assembly, and that he had a family. But from various sources, we found out that in 1818, he was captain of the Southern Regiment, and by 1828, he was a colonel. His brother, Robert, had replaced him as a captain. He had estates on the island, including Cane Wood and Kubai Maru. Have I got that right? I hope I've got that right. Dalzell brought the latter estate in 1823 with 62 enslaved persons. He sold it in 1825 with 171 enslaved persons to the Bale family. Delzell also owned in joint Mount Bentick estate in Charlotte Parish, land that was once held by the Caribs. The design of the memorial, with its covered aisle, is fairly standard, as is, sadly, the wealth of this man being based on the labour of enslaved peoples. Next slide. Robert Paul is another planter that owned what at the time was called slaves. He too was a senior member of the island's council. Paul, with a gentleman called Cole Turner, operated the St Vincent and Tobago wing of the Glasgow Trading Company, Alexander Houston & Co. Turner led the organisational efforts in Tobago, with Paul remaining on St Vincent. Robert Paul's son Charles was educated in England, and that was really common at the time and he actually went on to become a vicar in Ireland. He married Frances Keegan, who was the third daughter of Sir John Horne. Sorry, John Horne. Frances and Charles Paul had a son called Carl Charles Keegan Paul, who went on to found a publishing company that still exists today, Keegan Paul. Charles Keegan Paul, the grandson of the man commemorated here, published the letters of Mary Wollstonecraft, the philosopher and early advocate of women's rights, and the mother to Mary Shelley, who wrote the novel Frankenstein. John Horne, his father-in-law, was married to a member of the Otley family, and the Horns and Otleys owned several plantations on the island, including Reversion. Horn was connected by marriage to the East India Trading Company, and as such, Robert Paul and his circle stand as examples of the wide geographical links that estate owners on the island often had. But for us, more interesting is that Paul owned Kingstown Estate. In 1791, a 17-acre plot known as Lot 151 was sold to Messrs Walker and Atkinson. Together with additional land that became Kingstown Park Estate and Sorry, together with additional land, it became Kingstown Park Estate, and in 1817 was owned by Paul. But the aforementioned Atkinson married a woman called Frances. After his death, Frances Atkinson married William Gregg, 
And whilst he died in 1795 during the Second Carib War, Fanny Gregg, Francis Gregg, is buried 20 minutes from where I live in England, literally not very far from me at all. And our research has discovered that this Francis Gregg is the woman whom Gregg's village is named after. Next slide. Next, we move to John Roche Dacent, who was president of the council, so another significant person in the island's colonial past. As with Paul and Dalziel, he was well connected and owned slaves. North Union and South Union were in his ownership in 1834 when slavery was abolished, and he, like other slave owners, were compensated for the loss of his slaves, which were, before emancipation, his property. The history of enslavement is not one to delve into deeply here, but of course it was central to the lives of many of those that are commemorated in this place. And Dacent was one of those who was against emancipation and considered it ill-judged given the financial effect it would have on the economy of England and its colonies. And of course, his own personal wealth as a plantation owner. John Roche Dacent is interesting in terms of the notion of family fortune. He married Harriet Frances Irwin, daughter and heiress of Alexander Burroughs Irwin, who is commemorated in this cathedral. They had a son, John Berry Dacent, but Harriet died and then he married her sister, Charlotte Martha. This move clearly shows the importance of keeping wealth within a family, although if we're generous, maybe, if we're honest, it probably shows he wanted to remain wealthy. Harriet's father completely disapproved of the marriage and in his will withheld £5,000 from her inheritance. He did leave £8,000 to Charlotte though, which is around 2.4 million ECDs in today's money if you factor in inflation. And on the marriage, John would become very wealthy. Charlotte and John Roche had several children, Burry Irwin, Alexander, Charles Underwood and also George Webb. George went on to become assistant editor of the Times newspaper in London and was also a writer. He wrote stories about Anansi, the West, Indian, sorry, the West African trickster spider deity, and he collected these stories from enslaved individuals, most likely those working on his father's estates. As you can see, Charlotte and John also had a daughter who died in infancy. She's buried within the cathedral close to the memorial. What's interesting, though, is that the mason who was commissioned to memorialise baby Charlotte is not the same who was employed to commemorate her father. However, Bacon was the mason employed to memorialise her grandfather, Alexander Burroughs Irwin, and also his mother's sister, Harriet. So Niall and I are working on the transatlantic trade in memorials because we think there's something really interesting about this. Next slide. To start with the manufacture on the memorial, as you can see on this impressive marble plaque by J. Bacon of London, it memorialises the aforesaid Alexander Burroughs Irwin, who died in 1806, his daughter Harriet Francis and her son Henry Burry. The memorial names Alexander's wife Lydia, and interestingly, Lydia's first marriage produced Harry Hackshaw, who owned Hope Estate on the island, as well as Three Rivers. Unpacking the web of connections is proving tricky, but suffice to say the social elite of the island were hugely connected, a very close-knit community, with international connections that included England, Scotland, the East Indies and America. Now, Niall and I suggest that Don Roche may very well have had a strong hand in commissioning the memorial to his father-in-law, his brother-in-law and his first wife, and also in the memorial to his infant daughter Charlotte. That John Roche's memorial is manufactured by a different firm, Johnson of London, suggests it was commissioned by someone different. Alexander Burroughs Irwin had two sisters, Jane and Frances, and in his will of 1807, he left each of them and his wife an annuity of £100 a year. The equivalent today is a little over 32,000 ECDs. And don't forget, he left £8,000, which amounts to 675,000. Um, sorry, which amount now, now to £675,000 or nearly 2.4 million ECDs. So he left a lot of money to his family. He died a wealthy man and was really able to look after his nearest and dearest. Alexander's fortune, though, must have come in part from his father, Harry Alexander, who was an early plantation owner on the island. 
Harry purchased three lots in 1791, which collectively later became Montrose Estate, and from the name we can assume he had Scottish connections. A further lot of his eventually became part of Redemption Estate. The memorial specifies that Alexander was a military man and that his final resting place was near the north-western boundary of the churchyard. Given the burial was now 214 years ago, it's unlikely to be able to be traced, but one can assume it would have been an impressive grave. Daniel McDowell, as we can see here, was also a military man. He served in the Southern Regiment of the island's militia and would have served under the aforementioned William Grieg. He was a merchant in St Vincent and co-owner of Park Hill Estate and had business dealings with John Roche Dacent and others connected with Bentick Place Estate. On his death, he left a house in Kingstown, an annuity of £70 per annum to his long-standing housekeeper Anne, described in her will as, quote, a free mulatto woman, close quote. In today's money, Anne would be receiving 27,000 ECDs a year, so not an inconsiderable sum. The memorial was commissioned by his daughter Anne, who less than six months after losing her father, loses her husband. Anne and Peter Hill lived in Edinburgh, where he worked as a collector of land tax. Now, there are other McDowells in the records, but it's unclear as to their relationship. But what is clear is that there is a strong connection between Scotland and St Vincent. The next memorial to explore is that of John Ordain, and for this information I have to thank Dr Kathleen Charter, who's currently writing a book on the Ordains, um, who's helped me do some research on John. John, like Daniel McDowell, was a merchant and estate owner. However, whilst it's clear exactly what the relationship between Daniel McDowell had with the free mulatto housekeeper Anne, who he endowed a good deal of money on his death, John Ordain married a black woman. Her name was Hannah Bannantyne, and she was his second wife. His first wife, Anne Maria Dalwimple, died young. Hannah and John had a number of children before locating to London. One of their daughters, Ida Augusta, became a concert harpist and performed regularly from 1881 onward. Charter notes that, quote, all the reviews about Ida agree she was a talented, graceful performer and became famous in her field. Close quote. In fact, she was the first coloured woman to perform live at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Her colour was rarely commented on in England, and it's believed her brother Harley, who inherited Richmond Estate, may well have financially helped Ida in her musical career. The memorial to Morin speaks of great wealth. It's more elaborate than many we have spoken about here, and as such, you would assume that Morins were wealthy plantation owners. However, they were just storekeepers. The only record we have traces to a few years after the date of their clearly beloved daughter Janet. It concerns a London court case John and Samuel Moran won regarding the loss of a large amount of liquor, porter, stout and ale, aboard the Emerald, which was wrecked. The reason we can assert that despite them being alcohol merchants, they were not wealthy as many of their peers, is that in the 1826 list of subscriptions to the Society for the Conversion and Religious Instruction of the Negro Slave, John Morin pays two pounds, Dacent Mays pays 10 pounds, and Dalzell pays 20 pounds. So these two men were far wealthier, yet their memorials in the cathedral are not so impressive. So from this, we can see it's really important not to make assumptions when exploring, memor exploring memorials. For as Father Charles noted in November 2017, these memorials were an important symbol of social status within the colony, an important sign of long-term settlement here. The final memorial we've chosen to highlight, as with many of those above, speaks to the high death rate of the time, which was probably well over a third. John and Charlotte Dayson lose their daughter as an infant. Charlotte loses both her siblings and her father within five short years. Anne Hill's father and husband die within six months of each other. John Ordain loses his first wife and many children she bore, and the Morins have just nine months with their English-educated daughter before her life is cut short. But of all the memorials, that to Kirby is the saddest. Charles Kirby loses his 15-year-old daughter and his 21-year-old son in September and October of 1833. Then his 14-year-old daughter the following year, just a few months after the death of his 16-year-old son, who had previously narrowly survived a shipwreck off Barbados. 
These memorials then stand as testimony to the sad reality of life for those who settled here. Yet it must be remembered that many, many more who resided on St Vincent during this period of history go unremembered. Like many of those in the graveyard, the memorials are far too faded to read or largely ignored by all apart from the few who choose to spend time among them. And actually, most were probably far too poor or too insignificant to even warrant a grave marker. And that's really common. So we want to end here by suggesting that the dead should not be forgotten and that by engaging with memorials and the history and the stories they can tell, you can learn a lot about the island and the gaps in who is memorialised speak perhaps loudly of those who aren't. Thank you. Um, just quickly, um, t Tina's alluded to some work we've done on Barbados, and I think, I hadn't originally planned to do this, but we've just had something published that we'd like to share with you if you wish, and uh, we can pass our um, email around and we'll send it to you. Everyone likes a good ghost story. And one of the things in studying graveyards is that sometimes you, you come across a story that you, you look at and you run with it and you start to follow it through. And this happened to us in Barbados a couple of years ago. We were working at a cemetery on the south coast of Barbados that some of you might have heard of, the parish of Christ Church, Oystins. And there's a, there's a famous vault there called the Chase Vault, which is a story surrounding it of the moving coffins of the Chase Vault. And what happened was that back in 1816, whenever new interments were put in, the vault would be opened up and they would find the coffins displaced. And every time they would put these coffins back, and these would be big lead coffins, and lo and behold, the next time they opened up the Chase Vault to put someone back in, the coffins had been scattered and you can imagine that back in 1816 this caused a, a lot of talk in Barbados and it got people thinking of things like Obia and Duppies, Jumbies, magic and things like that. Well Christina and I we, we went to visit this um, vault and we looked and we, we got talking to two young girls who were playing with playing near the vault and they wouldn't go anywhere near it. So it was like 200 years later you know this power of this ghost story was still there. Well, again, it's one of the things that we, we like to do is we like to look a little bit beyond that. And one of the things that we did in our studies, which was a normal sort of historical stroke archaeological study of the Chase Vault, was we started to ask some more deeper historical questions and thinking about the context of those events. And what we've done is we've published a piece that's come out in folklore, which is one of the first attempts to try and understand the context of a ghost story and disturbed burials and so forth within the context of the Bussa uprising in 1816 and how it scared the planter class into trying to create more um, sort of solidity and more defences to be spent on the island. And it's amazing what you can find out just by looking at the history of one grave. And I hope that's what you've got from Christina's presentation there, that, that we might sound mad that we spend a lot of time walking around graveyards, but we're actually trying to answer some interesting questions. Okay, thank you. I guess... If anyone has any questions or comments, we'll... Yeah. Anyone got any questions for us? Yes? Um, have you got any experience of making tours of the graveyard? Yes. Such as we the tourist product of this building? Not within this building, but I'm working on um, a graveyard in England that opened in 
there's obviously the Hunter Cross in the graveyard. But, you know, there's, there's information, like we've got information on most of the memorials inside. Um, not all of them, I think I've probably done about half. So I need to, I've, I've still got some more work to do on tracing the ancestries and connections between the people who have these magnificent plaques. But certainly outside there are some interesting graves. What? Yeah. So, yeah, so one thing I'd say on the, the basis of this, what you'd do, the old fashioned approach, if we have lots of time, would be just to stretch loads of tape measures out and get a piece of planning paper and plot the graves in by hand. That is an unimaginably lengthy process. One of our colleagues who is the chief archaeologist of the Church of England, um, back home in the UK, has been giving in a huge amount of money to develop a very rapid survey methodology that consists of a backpack with basically a laser beam in it. And what you do is this backpack talks to satellites in the sky, as well as firing two million points per second around you. So basically what you do is you put your backpack on and you walk around the graveyard and within about, for this graveyard, possibly just half an hour, you will have a three dimensional scan of every single memorial here and it will be accurately plotted to millimeter accuracy and you'll be able to read the inscriptions and you'll be able to do lots and lots of things with it. So what we are hoping to do, and it's easy to say, we'll get some money and come and do it. It's not going to happen very easily, but what we would like to do, what's on our wish list, is to undertake some of that laser survey here and in Barbados, because these are very, very valuable historical resources. And obviously the weather means that a lot of them probably you know, in a couple of years' time, some more of the memorials that you can read now will be really bad and weathered. So, um, you know, it's really important, I think, that people start recording graves as soon as they realise that it's important. Because it doesn't take a lot for the, the words, the dates, the names to become legible. Um, there's, there's ways of trying to do it, but you've got to find out. Do anyone else here? Yeah. Have you 
Any other questions? Oh, yes. Well, I 
in this country. So what you have presented there, the way you knit it out here, so it's a blank voyage and so on. I am extremely grateful and I take the liberty to express the same thought for if not all, a lot of who have attended this function. So if there be no further questions or comments, Because if you, if you go to St. Michael's Cathedral in Barbados, you'll see a mix of, of, of plaques, some like this, and then others that commemorate really important figures in Barbados's um, history, uh, post-independence history in particular. So it's good, uh, there's a, uh, St. Peter's Church, for example, up in Spikestown in northwestern Barbados. Some, some of the memorials have been removed and put to one side, and other commemorations of uh, some of the priests, the parish priests and other notable people in the community have, have come into play. So you, you're carrying on the behaviour in a sense and I think that's important to keep a living tradition going. However, I would say I think it would be a real shame if you lost some of these memorials. It is a difficult part of your history, but they are, they are a historical resource. And if you lose them, and you lose them forever, they're gone for future generations. So I think if if you are going to remove any from this cathedral, maybe put them somewhere where people can look at them rather than just destroying them. Destroying the memorials will not destroy the past. Um, so I would say maybe put some new ones alongside them, or if you're going to remove these, put them somewhere safe where people can still learn from them. So we will continue the discussion as we interact with each other over the next few weeks, months, and I will certainly be asking Christina to give us a copy of her lecture this afternoon so that we can then delve some more into the information is there as she developed the ownership of Montrose and Kingstown and how that has shifted over time we can then begin to do our own continuation and tracing. And so I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon into the evening. And I thank our videographers and those who are streaming it live to persons who are not able to be here this afternoon for one reason or another. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Harvey, who is a PhD student of now. Avi, welcome to St. Vincent. I trust you'll stay was very well. And I will also take my privilege and ask the bishop to do the blessing for us.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. May Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And lovely to meet you. And thank you for your question. Okay. <laughs>